On this episode, we're going to be talking about Canon in Warhammer 40K. Dome Runners TV, your guide to the Underhive and beyond. Hey there, scabby scummers and gangers. Crimson Oracle here with another episode of Dome Runners TV. And today we are going to be talking about that most nebulous of concepts. And that is, of course, fictional canon as it applies to various fictional universes and specifically Warhammer 40K. Now, uh, this is a topic that I specifically am addressing because I saw a rather stupid meme uh, going around a few days ago uh, that specifically mentioned that you could tell someone is a Warhammer tourist when they say that Warhammer has no official canon. Since I've been talking about this specific topic since 2010, when I first read the first source we're going to go into about this, uh, I find that a slightly ironic, you know, as a tourist of Warhammer 40k who's been actively involved in the hobby uh, for 15 years now and uh, who was also active in the hobby as a kid. Uh, I find the whole thing to be uh, a bit ridiculous. This idea that like because people are uh, analyzing and looking at the media and coming up with you know various conclusions about it that of course that makes us Taurus uh, instead of simply taking you know uh, a few memes from Facebook and making those our personality. Um, you know far be it for me to uh, cast aspersions on people who like memes and like to joke about memes because I, I do too. I mean, I make memes about stuff and they oversimplify things and that's okay because it's a means of communicating an idea. It doesn't have to be perfect. But regardless, this meme in particular just really stuck in my craw because of course uh, this is something that's being made in order to look at things that are actually part of Warhammer and say that those things that are part of Warhammer aren't real Warhammer because they don't support this sort of, uh, you know, wild right wing anti anti LGBT uh, you know pseudo fascist BS that a lot of people you know not a majority certainly but a lot of people in the hobby uh, are kind of uh, they flog that kind of stuff I, I don't even know how much of it is is uh, you know those people's actual feelings and how much of it is performance but in the end uh, as I like to say I don't really care about what someone is thinking on the inside what matters to me is how they behave and there's a lot of you know shitty behavior in our community and uh, this is an example of it, and of course it's a bit silly uh, because they say both of these people, you know, these supposed infiltrators, claim to be lifelong fans but only got into it a year ago, but also are conspicuous consumers of the Warhammer 40k models and have big miniature collections and gatekeep people who don't buy miniatures, and the whole thing is very silly to me. As someone who goes out of my way to introduce people to the hobby and provide them with gangs in order for them to play, and of course, you know, have a large collection of models, not because I conspicuously consume with this giant hobby budget that, you know, I have because of being, you know, upper class or something. The reality is that I've been doing this for 15 years and that when you buy a kit or two every month for 15 years, you have a lot of models. Again, I've been actively playing since uh, 2007 and I, uh, you know, played Mordheim when I was a teenager and I had Battle Masters when I was a little kid and I've been playing the Warhammer video games since the mid 90s. So, I mean, if anyone has been steeped in Warhammer their whole life, it's it's me. You know, one of my stepdad's friends worked at the Battle Bunker in Baltimore when that was the head of GW in the area. He was one of the studio painters. I, you know, grew up looking at his incredibly well-painted uh, models and I fell in love. And that's why I've been in this hobby so long. Um, and to, to sort of have uh, aspersions cast because I have uh, enough common sense to sort of understand satire and I happen to like writers who are actually talented at writing and various other things. Uh, to say that I'm a tourist, eh, yeah, it's, it's a bit silly. It's a bit absurd. And I think that some of them at least know that they're being, you know, that they're being absurd, that they're, that they're being incorrect. And that's, that's sort of the point. The point is to sort of create this, uh, you know, this straw man opponent that they can easily dismiss as not being a true fan. Well, guess what? I am a true fan. I've been here as long as any of you my age have been here. And I'm going to tell you why Warhammer has no canon. 
If you like our content, don't forget to like and subscribe, and for as little as $2 a month you can become a patron and help support the show. So the topic of canon in Warhammer, of course, uh, is a little bit different from the topic of canon in, say, the Star Wars universe or Star Trek universe, because those universes were primarily created as a storytelling environment. So they come from these people wanted to make a movie or, or a TV show in the case of Star Trek. And so they created a world and when you do that, when you create a world and you start telling concrete stories in it, you are going to lay down uh, truths, facts, various things about your universe that may become inconvenient later when your story expands and continues past when you necessarily initially planned for it. So as you sort of deal with those difficulties, those, those conflicts, you wind up choosing what is and isn't part of your story as you go. You retcon is the term. And this is, of course, a, you know, a process that every fictional universe has to go through. I mean, the Terminator universe retcon stuff, all kinds of things change in any long running uh, story or series, you are going to have to deal with conflicts and that's okay. In Warhammer, there's a huge difference, which is that Warhammer was not created as a film or a TV show or a book series. Warhammer was created as a very open environment for you to tell stories on the tabletop. And I've talked about this before. Warhammer was conceived of as a sandbox. It's an environment. It's somewhere that you can go, where you can uh, look at these stories, where you can tell these stories on your own. You can bring in models from other model lines was the original intent. You can play with whatever you want. You know, you could bring historical models in, those can be guardsmen because guardsmen are not necessarily high tech soldiers. Some of them come from feudal worlds. Some of them have barely any equipment and you know, they have muskets that are, you know, las guns and that sort of thing. And that was intentional. Warhammer was constructed at the creation of Rogue Trader to be this open-ended environment where anything could happen, you could bring in anything you want. And that, I think, is the genius part of Warhammer that made it so successful, because it was able to encompass any new trend. Anime gets popular, okay, well, we'll add a faction that looks like anime mechs. Uh, you know, oh, Terminator was really successful, Terminator 2 was really successful, let's add a faction that looks like Terminator robots. You know, that kind of thing, really enabled Warhammer to grow and change and adapt because it wasn't based around a core story that was fixed. Now, the difficulty comes in when, in the 90s, GW starts to want to fill in the background a little bit, create more engaging environments and background and stories and all that stuff. And so you start to see all these stories come out in the codexes. And then, of course, there is the introduction of Black Library and all the fiction that comes out of that. And you get into the situation where suddenly this very open ended, very, very sandbox story becomes much more dependent on the idea of a, a, a set fixed background. And the way that that was dealt with in Warhammer was to not engage in this sort of official this is canon, this isn't discussion. I can go straight to the source here. Gav Thorpe wrote in 2010 in a blog post titled Jumping the Fence. It used to be the case that I had one foot on either side of the fence when it came to Black Library. By day I was a game developer, evening and weekend saw me in the guise of swashbuckling author. One of the roles of GW Games developers was to liaise with Black Library, answering their questions and generally providing consultation. The BL editors were well versed in the worlds of Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000, so it was usually the case that inquiries directed to games dev would concern either very specific questions or areas where the existing background was unclear or perhaps contradictory. For the most part, these discussions revolved around extrapolations by the authors, extending areas of background into subjects that were not relevant to the material needed for tabletop war games. Does this sound right, or is this how it would work? It was rare that we would be past anything that was so hideously off the mark that the story or novel was completely verboten. <laughs> We've had this story about squats. 
Far from being the black jackboot of authoritarianism, I like to think we provided possible solutions to problems that cropped up. Sometimes an author or an editor might have a situation they need to resolve and ask for background friendly suggestions. For instance, an author might want orcs invading a moon, but was not sure how the greenies would operate on an airless world. Rather than say that would never happen, we would have to think about it and provide some viable answers. Probably something like a mobile force field in this case. That was the day job. The ability of an author to write within an established setting isn't about knowing every single detail of the background, though targeted research is always good, it's about understanding the style and ethos of that universe. With a grounding in the principles of that world, an author can extend the logic, or lack, to cover places, people, and situations not explicitly detailed in the source material. That's sort of the point of tie-in fiction, to expand on what is already published, not simply to package it up with a slightly different form. Having been inculcated in the mysteries and ways of Warhammer and Warhammer 40k for years, I was in the enviable position as an author of being able to say to an editor, yes, that's exactly how it works. After all, if they were uncertain about something, it was me they were going to ask. I was going to say this put me in a unique position, but unfortunately those Johnny Come Lately's Graham McNeil, Andy Hoare, and Ant Reynolds have all made the transition from games developer to author. I'm sure if you ask them on their blogs, they'll be able to tell you about their experiences in this regard. He then goes on to talk a little bit about writing outside of GW before getting to the most relevant part of the piece. Fire the Cannon, the advantage of Warhammer as tie-in worlds. I think that Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 have a unique advantage in the realm of tie-in backgrounds. They exist to allow personal creativity. Both are backdrops, nothing more. They were created to allow people to collect armies of toy soldiers and fight battles with them. They were conceived with the idea that the player's creative freedom was directed but not restricted. In Warhammer, you can have anything from ogres to ninjas, and even ninja ogres. Warhammer 40,000 trumpets an imperium of a million worlds precisely because that leaves room for everyone to come up with what they like. Hobbyists can create armies, places, worlds, color schemes, characters, and stories for themselves. Often folks ask if black library books are canon. With Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000, the notion of canon is fallacy. There are certain established facts. The current emperor is Karl Franz. The Blood Angels have red armor. Commissar Yarek defended Hades Hive during the Second War of Armageddon. However, to suggest that anything else is non-canon is a disservice to the players and authors who participated in this world. To suggest that Black Library novels are somehow lesser of lesser relevance to the background is to imply that every player who's created a unique Space Marine chapter or event of their own Elector Count is somehow wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 exist as tens of thousands of overlapping realities in the imaginations of games developers, writers, readers, and gamers. None of these interpretations is wrong. Whether a particular author's take on the world matches up with an individual gamer's or reader's is another matter. The fact that each of us is allowed to take possession of the world and envisage it to our own ideal means that it is inevitable our vision will sometimes clash with the vision of others. Such conflict does not render either vision obsolete. In this regard, it's the job of authors and game developers to illuminate and inspire, not to dictate. Perhaps you can disagree with the portrayal of a certain faction or a facet of their society doesn't make sense in your version of the world. You may not like the answers presented, but in asking the question, you can come up with a solution that matches your vision. As long as certain central themes and principles remain, you can pick and choose which parts you like and dislike. The same applies to transference from Black Library back into the gaming supplements. If the developers and other creative folks believe a contribution by an author fits the bill and has an appeal to the audience, why not fold it back into the game world, such as Gaunt's Ghosts or characters from Gotrek and Felix? On the other hand, if an author has a bit of a wobbly moment, there's no pressure to feel like it has to be accepted into the worldview promulgated by the codexes and army books. And besides, there simply isn't enough room in those gaming books to include everything from the hundreds of novels, good, bad, or indifferent as we see them, so the decision must ultimately rest with the taste of the individual reader and gamer. Aaron Dembski Bowden expressed similar sentiments in a blog post on Boomtron.com. It's all real and none of it's real. One of the great mistakes made by almost every fan of Warhammer 40,000 is to take the canonical rules from other licenses and crowbar them into 40k. Usually it's an unconscious assumption based on a mix between common sense and Star Wars, which is a combination you don't expect to see every day. It also works about as well as you'd think. Part of the problem is that 40k lore is essentially divided into three sub-companies all producing material, and as with 
all things, quality, themes, perceptions, and intentions can be completely different. Games Workshop produces the games and core setting lore with 30-ish years of history, releasing a couple of source books a year. Black Library is the publishing arm, mostly centered on novels, and still very new in terms of producing canon. The third is Forge World, an allied design studio and miniature production company. Note, an even more recent addition is Fantasy Flight Games, who produced 40k role-playing game, but even now I'm not sure where they stand. Like I said, it's a complicated hellhole of treachery, madness, and deceit. As it stands, the official line is that there are three factions empowered to create IP, an exact quote, and that's GW, Black Library, and Forge World. Given that the 40k RPG is mostly made by folks working in and around the main three companies, I think it's fair to say that its lore counts as canon too. I got it wrong myself right up until I was at a meeting with the company's intellectual property manager, a situation I find myself in several times a year as part of the Horace Heresy novel series team. When I was specifically asking about canon, he replied with something I've tried to take to heart. It's all real, and none of it's real. It's a bit of an epiphany, to tell you the truth. It reminds me of that rather cool Qui-Gon Jinn line, your focus determines your reality. He does a few bits, and then we skip down to, uh, where was I? Oh right, 40k canon. In short, the belief is usually that the design studio has precedence, and everything else is in canon. That's actually wrong, but several aspects reinforce the misjudgment. Not least that a few top brass quotes have been poorly phrased or taken out of context. Some novelists wildly diverging from the source material for reasons apparent to no one but themselves, and the fact that the design studio has 30 years of history where it was essentially the sole source of canon. Its products are the foundation for the whole license. It's the source, the core, the chewy nougat center at the heart of it all. With the weight of history and it's as by far the most widespread, its published lore reaches the most eyes and ears. I don't begrudge that. In fact, I, in 98% of situations, I do my level best to cleave to whatever the design studio source books tie to, into what I'm writing. I'm an unashamed fanboy and I've spent 20 years loving the 40K universe. I'm in this to add to or explore it, to tell stories within it, not to change it to hell and back on some sneering authorial whim. But the novels never agree. Black Library can suffer more than most when it comes to in terms of what's official and what isn't, for two reasons. Firstly, at its inception and during the first few years, it seemed unapologetically non-canon, and from my limited perception, it didn't seem to be anything else. It was separate from the design studio, and that was that. Times have changed, but we're lingering in the aftermath. Like hotel room stains of dubious origin, bad things can stick and stick hard. Secondly, like any publisher, Black Library releases works from a host of different people, each with their own perceptions and preferences. Because of the sheer amount of material released, conflicts arise between what seems like established facts. One author has a weapon firing one way, another author describes its mechanics completely differently. Is there an official stance? No, on a lot of in-universe stuff, there's usually not. Interpretation and imagination within the framework is the name of the game. The issue is when people consider that a flaw, not a feature. It's supposed to be an open invitation to creative freedom, but instead it's often disparaged as a way to hide mistakes or lore clashes. Don't get me wrong, I know mistakes occur. Having loose cannon is no excuse for crappy research or poor writing, and I would never suggest otherwise. As a personal example, when describing the retinal eye lens display in Space Marine Helmets, my ideas for what a soldier can see and do in his HUD are fairly divergent from most other authors' descriptions. I can show lore to back up my viewpoint, and they can bring lore to highlight theirs. I can wax poetic on why I think my version is better and makes for a better touch in a story, blah blah blah. I don't see it as a problem, but many fans loathe this kind of thing. Luckily, I've never had any complaints about this exact example, but I'm being nice and not naming any authors who do fall prey to that kind of feedback. Essentially, any difference is immediately considered a deviation. Any contradiction is automatically seen as a mistake. Although I've been intensely fortunate with fan feedback and my reviews are most definitely on the kinder and more favorable side of the wall, I've seen a few mentions where someone flat out says I've got a specific detail wrong purely because they've chosen to cite a variant source as canon. It's, shall we say, frustrating, but I don't blame anyone for thinking it. It's a complicated situation. A suit of armor powered by happy thoughts and unicorn kisses. I've read 40k novels that categorically violate my opinions and perceptions of how 40k works, and I have no trouble ignoring them afterwards. Similarly with some design studio sourcebooks. If I come across an idea that I find patently uh, in conflict with my views, there's some diplomacy for you, I'll just ignore it and try not to write about it. 
Interestingly, as, a, as creators in this setting were under no strict obligation to reference one another, and cooperation is usually self-driven. The exception to this is the Horus Heresy series, which is extremely well organized and all of us are in constant communication. Sure, editorial prefers it when stuff ties together, but it's not a mandate. Everyone views the setting differently, after all. I still have an email in my inbox from my editor asking, why did you reference X in your novel? I also have my reply. It says, quite simply, because X sucks and so does the guy who wrote it. That's show business for you. So is there a consensus? Negatory, there really isn't. On one hand, it's a bit of an emotional kick to the balls. I mean, everything you do will be seen as incorrect by some internet guy, and they have as much right to enjoy 40k stuff as me, you, or anyone else. I don't sit at my desk rubbing my hands together delighting in the fact that I might have annoyed fan number 3,974,910 because I said commander, dude, guy, and zigs instead of zags. I sympathize with the irritation, I felt it myself for a long time, and it's a bitter taste is familiar to me as all the photos of Lily Cole I have on my hard drive. But on the other hand, Loose Cannon is one of the keys to why 40k has evolved into something so completely awesome. I'm being dead serious here. Yes, it can be considered a mark of IP laziness, and yes, I'm not blind to the fact that 20 to 30 years ago, a lot of 40k's core concepts were referential half-jokes thrown around by amateur game designers, rather than the underpinnings of a more classic sci-fi setting envisioned by ivory tower artists. But the loose framework has allowed three decades of fresh canon to flood in, filling in the details without necessarily feeling too constrained by what came before. Even as someone who fiercely cleaves to canon at every opportunity, I'm constantly surprised by the sheer amount of white space left open to explore and set up shop. Within the possibility of endless interpretation lies the potential for freedom. What matters is respecting the source material, contributing to it, and sticking to the theme. And that ties right back into my first column, because no matter who's writing the details, 40k has some unalterable themes, etched into the stoniest of the stone. They're the key, and they're what matters most. And then in the comments of this article, one of the other big designers, Andy Hoare, pipes in, it's all, it all stems from the assumption that there's a binding contract between author and reader to adhere to some non-existent subjective construct or true representation of the setting. There is no such construct and no such objective truth. I understand that Tolkien took decades developing his setting before publishing the story set within it and still made mistakes. 40k is an ever-evolving setting designed first and foremost to house a really cool game, and as such things don't always mesh or translate, or they, actually very occasionally, get changed outright. I know which I'd rather be reading and writing. And then Aaron Dembski Bowden also relays this quote from Mark Gascon, who said it best in an old quote when he was head of Black Library, keep in mind Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 are worlds where half-truths, lies, propaganda, politics, legends, and myths exist. The absolute truth, which is implied when you talk about canonical background, will never be known because of this. Everything we know about these worlds is from the viewpoints of people in them which are as a result incomplete and even sometimes incorrect. The truth is mutable, debatable, and lost as the victors write the history. Here's our standard line. Yes, it's all official, but remember that we're reporting back from a time when the stories aren't always true or at least 100% accurate. If it has the 40K logo on it, it exists in the 40K universe, or it was a legend that may well have happened, or a rumor that may or may not have any truth behind it. Let's put it another way. Anything with a 40k logo on it is as official as any codex, and at least as crammed full of rumors, distorted legends, and half-truths. I think the real problem for me, and I speak for no other, is that the topic as a big question doesn't matter. It's all as true as everything else, and just as false, half-remembered sort of true. The answer you're seeking is yes and no, or perhaps sometimes, and for me, that's the end of it. Now ask us some specifics, e.g., can Black Templars spit acid, and we can answer that one, and many others. But again, note that the answer may, be, may well be sometimes, or it varies, or depends. But is it all true? Yes and no. Even though some of it is plainly contradictory, yes and no. Do we deliberately re-contradict or tell with differences? Yes, we do. Is the newer the stuff is, the truer it is? Yes and no. In some cases, is it true that the older stuff is the truest? Yes and no. Maybe and sometimes. Depends, and it varies. It's a decaying universe without GPS and galaxy-wide communication, where precious facts are clung to long after they've been changed out of all recognition. Read a Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller about monks toiling to hold onto facts in the aftermath of a nuclear war. That nails it for me. So as you can see, there's a pretty strong case 
for the concept that Warhammer 40k does not have a fixed immutable canon, in that the people in charge of making sure that those things happen, and of course the writers, are operating under the assumption that there's no fixed immutable canon. It's pretty straightforward. So the idea that this is somehow an apocryphal statement that makes you a pretender is, you know, absurd. Like, as though these people, you know, 12 years ago, when talking about this stuff, were intentionally misleading people because of their nefarious schemes or what, what? I don't know. I don't get it. Why would Gav Thorpe say this about Warhammer 40k unless that's what he thought about it? Where's the angle? So that gives you an idea. And I think the reasoning is pretty clear. We don't have a fixed canon in 40k because they want the flexibility for people to be able to tell their own stories. That's part of the appeal. That's what makes 40k the thing that it thrives as being. And have you noticed that other IPs, even from successful companies, have struggled to break into this industry? I mean, look at Star Wars. It has had some success, of course. X-Wing, all that stuff. Legion exists. I, I don't know how popular it is. It's hard to say. But when you look at what these you know, properties bring into the, into the world, it's, there's a little bit less flexibility. It's really hard to necessarily tell the exact kind of story you want to when you're playing in a universe that is so much more prescribed. And that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, you know, Star Wars does not have to be a very prescribed setting. There are a million worlds in Star Wars, just like in Warhammer 40k. But in the case of Star Wars, for some reason, they seem really focused on telling a very specific slice of that setting. Warhammer 40k, on the other hand, it definitely wanders all throughout. Now, they have definitely their own biases and they focus on certain things more than others, but as you can see, 40k does not hew to these strict lines about canon and never was intended to because it's supposed to be for us to play with. And here's the secret, the real lurking underneath truth of all of this. It doesn't matter what the creators think because every fictional universe, every story is by its very nature changed, interfaced with, and reconstructed and recreated by the audience. That's right, nothing is canon. Yes, I know, obviously certain properties try to maintain at least a specific recounting of what is really part of the background and what is sort of extra and, you know, to be considered legends or nonsense or what have you. And, you know, Star Wars is a good example of that, which is why I keep coming back to it. Uh, I just, I don't know that much about the current state of Star Trek canon. Uh, Star Wars is one of the properties with the most defined canon. And as uh, Aaron Damsky Bowden was saying, that is partially why people are bringing that concept of canonization into discussing 40K. But ultimately, does it matter whether the company is telling you what's true or not. There are plenty of people for whom the original extended universe of Star Wars is the true canon. And they view all of the later Star Wars stuff from Disney as, you know, just being this sort of extra stuff that, that really isn't happening in the world that they envision. And that's okay. You don't have to like The Mandalorian or Clone Wars or any of that stuff. It, I love that stuff, so I'm, I'm not here to judge. Uh, I think that it's fine to prefer those things. I just finished a speed read through the first four books of the Dune series, and I'm stopping here because I don't like five or six, and I don't consider them to be part of that core story. I think that they're kind of the worst things that Herbert ever did. I'm just not a big fan of the later books, and I don't think that they necessarily need to be where the story goes. There's even more people who reject the later books, supposedly based on Frank Herbert's notes that his son and Kevin Anderson wrote. Hey, Kevin Anderson, when did he get famous doing again? Oh right, Star Wars Extended Universe Fiction. So, you know, if you don't like Kevin Anderson, you're probably not gonna count his books in Star Wars or Dune as canon, and that's okay, because 
what's true to each and every one of us is actually what matters about a story. The story isn't just what's on the page. It's what's it's interaction with all of your thoughts and memories and your creativity and imagination and the references that you draw on. You know, you can hear a description, uh, the same description as someone else and come up with a wildly different idea. And that's okay. That's just part of the process of being a person and interpreting information. And this is why fandoms are so potent because they come together and people share all their different views and it fuels everyone else's creativity. This is what leads to fan fiction. This is what leads to these things that keep your property alive and thriving. So even from this sort of myopic capitalist perspective, maintaining an open view is much, much better for everyone in the long run. It gives you that sort of room to run. And trying to be too strict about, oh, this is, you know, this can't change, this is fixed, this is immutable, it will not benefit you in the long run to be that strict. That's my view anyway. But even if you try, your fans aren't necessarily going to play ball. They are co creating this universe because you may have written it, but they're the ones doing the imagining. Each person as a consumer of this media, is creating an entire universe in their mind as they read it. And they bring everything that they have inside of them and their memory and their thoughts along with them. And this process, this, you know, combining of these things is why these, you know, these fan fantastic stories become so popular because they are so inspiring. They make us want to imagine this world in more depth and detail. I, I get a little bit exhausted dealing with this idea that, you know, there's only one way to view these backgrounds. And guess what? This means that the world as imagined by people who I think are toxic and assholes is still their world as experienced. And that's okay for them to have. You may disagree with the author and you may have a different interpretation. And that's just life. And if we can get to the point that we can all accept that about media, I think we can all have a better discussion about what we like and dislike in different media. Because too often things come down to this sort of good, bad, perspective, and I think that it misses the nuance of what makes fiction interesting. At least that's how I see it. Your experience might be different, and uh, you know, that's sort of what I'm getting at. So yeah, I think that it's something that comes up a lot, but it doesn't need to be uh, something that is so vexing. In the end, what you want out of the story is what matters. It's not really about the author. It's not really about the company that owns the property. It's about your expectation and your needs as the person who is imagining the story. And it's especially important that in, for example, a tabletop game where storytelling is a major component, narrative is a big part of it, that you not be shackled and held back by a specific way that things are supposed to work. Just as much as I think it's, you know, ridiculous that people tend to get mad in the Necromunda community when people try to add Space Marines into in Necromunda games. They get really upset and it causes this friction and it's not necessary. Just because for your version of the Underhive there shouldn't be Space Marines or Crude or what have you doesn't mean that's an illegitimate thing for someone who does imagine that to bring into their games. It's everyone's story and that's what's so fun and cool about all of this stuff. It's, it's not that we are, you know, recreating the exact historical uh, alignment of, you know, which sash and where are their buttons and all that stuff. You know, that element of historical gaming can be very rewarding for people who engage with it. And I'm not disparaging it, but our type of gaming is emphasizing something very different because that is appealing in its own right. Freedom, extreme freedom, the way we have in 140K, is awesome. It allows you to see things that are absolutely mind-blowing. You should look at the Inc. 28 community. And by the way, Inquisitor was written by Gav Thorpe, who provided the first quote in this essay. 
it's obvious that these environments are a really great source of inspiration for artists who are working in this medium. And these people come up with stories and they come up with visuals and they come up with models and all of this stuff. And it just drives forward everyone else to try their hand to create. Seeing Blanchitsu and the Inquisitor 28 stuff in the White Dwarf and the Warhammer Visions magazine, which by the way, if you have Warhammer Plus, check out all the archive of Warhammer Visions. It's something that you wouldn't necessarily think uh, to, to check out, but there is a Blanchitsu segment in a lot of them. And all of those are still awesome to this day because they show some truly inspired creations. And that inspired me to get into Inc. 28. And there were a bunch of other people who also experienced that. And now we are all sort of driving it further and further. In fact, Inc. 28 has spawned multiple spin-offs that aren't even Warhammer related. Turnip 28 is another setting that I, I have dabbled in in terms of modeling that I would love to play games in, but you know, who has the time, uh, that is the result of this creativity bubbling up and, and sort of spilling into another setting. So, you know, f instead of sci-fi, instead of fantasy, uh, you know, medieval fantasy, this takes a Napoleonic era and it does fantastical things with that. And it's really rewarding to experience that. And then someone else looks at that and they might come up with their own way of telling the story. And it might mix with other things, cyberpunk or, you know, all of these different genres that are out there, Infinity, you know, Malifaux, all that kind of stuff. And you could see something even newer or wonderf more wonderful created. And all of this is just this joyous celebration of human creativity. So. I think that it makes sense that people who are trying to impose their worldview on other people across a huge number of settings would struggle with this concept. There is a strong element out there in society who are really offended and scared of change. And that's something that you can't get away from with a story. No matter how much you try to hold the gate, you are on shifting ground. The audience continues to change. New people enter every year and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop time. You can't stop any of this. And that's just life. And it's good and it's okay. It's okay. Languages change too. The actual fundamental words that you read will change in meaning over the course of your lifetime and several lifetimes in the future. It's hard to read things that were written more than a few hundred years ago for that exact reason. Stories, language, human society are something that we are co-creating all the time. And trying to contain that or force it into a box is a mistake. At least, that's one woman's opinion. I want to thank White Bat Audio for providing the music for the show. Uh, thanks as always to my patrons. You guys make all of this possible. You too can become a patron for as little as $2 a month. Just hop on over to patreon.com slash dome runners. And of course, don't forget to check out the podcast, The Dome Runners. I am recording a new episode this very day. So uh, you'll soon be getting episode, I don't know, 66 or something. Uh, oh, order 66. I might have to do something with that. And of course, everybody out there, please stay safe and don't forget to change your paint water.